Happy Friday, everyone. Today is February 19th, and this is episode 19 of our Google Hangouts podcast and all things docs. I'm Brady Volpe, founder of the Volpe Firm and Nimble This. Today for our show, we have two great guests. The first is our tried and true John Downing, CMTS technical lead at Cisco Systems. Hi, John. Great to have you back. Well, good to be back. Thank you, Brady. See and you. also, we have with us uh, our special guest, Jeff Finkelstein, Executive Director of Network Strategy at Cox Communications. Jeff, it's great to have you with us today. Uh, thanks, Brady. Good to be here. Hey, John. Hey. <laughs> so today we're going to cover a number of topics, including uh, Cable Labs Winter Conference that happened last week, the NCTC's Winter Educational Conference, SCT's Chapter PNM Training that John and I did this past week, and. Uh, so first we're going to cover some things in the, in the news. Cable Labs has announced a newly unveiled project at Cable Labs that illustrates how DOCSIS 3.1 technology uh, can, can be evolved to basically support bi-directional uh, gigabit traffic over the network. And um, I'm, I'm really kind of interested in this. It looks like we're going to be evolving the Cable, tech spe or the cable Labs DOCSIS 3.1 specification that gives us sort of gigabit down traffic but not symmetrical uh, gigabit upstream traffic to allow us to have symmetrical gigabit down, gigabit up. Um, I'm really interested in like how, do, how does this work and, and would it work you know in, in a non-passive HFC system or is this only going to work in a passive HFC System, um, Jeff, have you heard uh, more about this, or is this is this kind of just like brand new news uh, out on the street? So we've been working on it probably about three years now, and and the idea was that the challenge we threw out and what created Doxis 3.1 in the end was how do you do gigabit services over a coax network. And we, we took the, the original DOCSIS spec and, and in working with uh, a new, newer technology, OFDM, LDPC, et cetera, came up with DOCSIS 3.1. <clears throat> the next challenge was, now that we did that, as we, as we do the, uh, the traditional um, interpolation of what is, what's going to be needed in years to come, we know that it takes typically five years or so from starting a spec to where you actually uh, have something that is is a product, but it's usually another year or two before that when you're when you're in an investigative phase or phase. So we started thinking along those lines and said, what can we do with it going forward? And what came out of it was some work that was done with uh, Stanford University, Bell Labs, and other folks, and said. How can we take some newer technologies like echo cancellation and having integrated transceivers to be able to simultaneously transmit and receive signals on the same cable? And where that ended up was uh, a technology very similar to what is being done in, in the mobile space with using a form of digital subtraction where if the device knows what it's transmitting and it receives a signal, if it subtracts the transmitted signal from what it received, what it's left with is what was transmitted from the other side. And that's what's become the next generation of DOCSIS spec. The number still is uh, still up in the air, whether it actually goes from a, a science project to an actual product still remains to be seen. But it does have the potential for providing a 10 gigabit symmetrical capability in a one gigahertz plant and potentially can work even higher. Yeah, so so what I saw, and, and ca anyone can, can look at this, Cable Labs has uh, this posted on, uh, you know, kind of like the constructs of, or sort of an outline and diagram of their specification on their website, so you can check that at cablelabs.com. And it had some unique graphics, so they showed how we're currently doing TDMA in the upstream with our existing DOCSIS specification where, you know, multiple modems are using time division multiple access in the upstream channel. It kind of looks like they're saying this new specification concept would allow 
all communications in DOCSIS to do this, not just from 5 to 42 megahertz, but we'd basically do this with the entire frequency spectrum. So to me, it sounds like we would have, in order to do this, we'd have to eliminate diplex filters from the plant. Is, and, and so if we eliminate diplex filters, we would have a, this would be a passive plant technology for DOCSIS. Am I correct in, in, assu in assuming that, or is there some other way that we would use this technology with a, a, a bi-directional HFC plant? So in, in its purest form, you would want to be in a diplexerless plant. That there have been some work done in, in MOCA in particular, with, which is a, a similar technology, where you could potentially have an amplifier, but it's got to be a very intelligent, expensive amplifier. The way that it works most efficiently is in a passive coax or node plus zero type of plant. Now, you can make it work in a diplexer plant, but you don't get to use the whole spectrum. So think of it, if you have, for example, a traditional 5 to 42, 54 to 1002 cable plant, you could take a portion of that downstream. So you might use 5 to 42 for your upstream, or it could be 65, 85, whatever you were going to use. You could then take 100, 200, or whatever, to 500 for your legacy single carrier qualms, 500 to, to 750 for your DOCSIS 3.1 or, or whatever spectrum you were going to use, but then you take that upper spectrum and you could make that your full duplex DOCSIS 3.1 uh, or DOCSIS 3.1x uh, upstream downstream scenario. And then you could grow that over time as you got away from single carrier qualms. You could move 3-1 down, or you could put the, the next-gen DOCSIS in that space. You could also have it coexist because it's using 3.1 carriers so that you could actually share the downstream or theoretically share the upstream and let the scheduler deal with making sure that there's no collisions in that, in that spectrum that the legacy devices are working in. But if I if I have this full duplex and from my house I decide that I'm going to have this new device do this full duplex at uh, say 500 to 700 megahertz whatever it happens to be and I transmit from my house how does my upstream from 500 to 700 megahertz get backwards through my fiber node how does it transmit so the fiber node is not just a node plus zero the fiber node has to be uh, some hardware has to change there as well. Well, you would have to be in a distributed architecture for it to work. So that when you're in a, when you move the CMTS CCAP into a remote PHY device Fine. kind of scenario, mm -hmm. you would be handling it at that point because that's where the, the, either it would be just the PHY or if you're in a Mac gotcha. PHY, whatever you I gotcha. do. So the optics really is an Ethernet or digital optics, no more analog amplitude modulated optics. That's correct. Okay. So, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a unique uh, expansion of DOCSIS. It definitely uh, allows us to extend. We get to, say, a node plus zero technology where we have that passive opportunity, and then it changes the dynamics of, say, you know, when we may move to a pawn solution. It could extend for the, the lifespan of DOCSIS a little bit further. So. Yeah, and, and I don't think there's any doubt that HFC in general has got a long useful life ahead of it and it's just how do we how do we take as much advantage of its inherent capabilities as we possibly can without doing anything crazy and being able to leverage the investments that we've made over time push fiber deeper going to that fiber deep architecture getting node housings in that will be upgradable from potentially a legacy node to adding in DOCSIS 3.1 remote PHY uh, uh, modulation and then be able to replace that over time with a next-gen DOCSIS which will also be backwards compatible. And that way we're leveraging all of these investments, getting fiber closer, and then you can adapt uh, your, your deployment scenarios into a very micro-segmentation view and do demand-based bandwidth. So that as you, you grow above 
the gigabit services we'll have with Doxus 3.1, you'll be able to go into many multi-gigabit services with next-gen Doxus and still be able to retain some of those sunk assets we've been putting it out in the, in the outside plant for all these years. Right. Awesome. Awesome. Thank, so thanks for the, uh, the background on that, Jeff. That, that uh, sheds a whole lot more light on the information that uh, is available on Cable Labs right now. So uh, speaking of uh, Cable Labs, they had their winter conference last week. I was not able to, ten, to attend. Uh, it wasn't in Orlando, so I, I, I think the weather was a little colder uh, than people were uh, t expecting to have. Um, Jeff, I think you were there. Uh, John, right. I don't think you could make it, but th Jeff, uh, any any other exciting news uh, during the, the winter conference? Well, I think that the big news uh, next to NextGen Doxis was uh, Cable Labs 2.0. That Cable Labs is in the midst of reinventing itself <clears throat> into, into a number of very distinct organizations. One is the cable labs we've known all these years, the testing labs for providing certification and qualification of DOCSIS equipment. The other two that they've created are an R&D branch, which is more focused on the zero to three year, the 80, 90 percent success rate for new technologies. The new one is an innovation branch which is more focused on three to eight years and coming up with ideas for technologies that we can potentially leverage as an industry in the future. Hmm. So in Cable Labs 2.0, I mean, there's still a, a nonprofit organization. They're just expanding their, basically their R&D into different realms. Is that the, the focus of it? Correct, yeah, they're, they're shifting the financial capital that they have available and they're, and they're structuring it so that as opportunities arise, whether it's in an R&D or an innovation branch, they can be very malleable and take advantage of the, uh, the money that they have available and move it into the areas that, that they can have the most impact. Now they did create a for-profit branch. Um, it was Network FX originally, and I think they've rebranded it Curio, which is where they're going to make things available on, on a for-profit ba basis for testing and analysis, et cetera. Right. And I saw there, there was an announcement that Cable Labs is going to do some, they're going to have like a small incubator or something like that where they're going to work with some companies that may be doing like startups and uh, some innovative technologies that benefit the cable industry and uh, they're going to help help guide those organizations in one ways or another to, to uh, as they grow and develop to, to uh, develop technologies to benefit the cable organizations. Yeah, that's correct. They've made a, a lot of investments in developing a world-class innovation, innovation organization. Um, they've brought in a lot of outside talent. Uh, the CEO, Phil McKinney, has got a very good background and a, and a good track record of success doing this at a number of firms. So it, it, it's really a pretty exciting time for, for the cable industry and for Cable Labs itself. Yeah, it's, it's great to see them expand and change. So that's awesome. Um, so uh, last, or actually it was this week, it's been a long week for me. Um, so you mentioned uh, Cable Labs test labs and stuff. Uh, I think the, the head of their test lab is Matt Schmidt. Um, he and I were at the NCTC. Uh, NCTC, if, if you're not aware of that, is the National Cable Television Cooperative. They have a, a really big focus on Tier 2 and Tier 3 cable operators and, and put that, pull all of them together and focus a lot of training and do different things with them. Uh, one of the things that they have is a winter education conference, uh, which was in Phoenix, Arizona this past Monday and Tuesday. I had the opportunity, along with Matt Schmidt, we did a panel on uh, DOCSIS 3.1 and uh, it was fiber to the curb or fiber to the home but it, it was really focusing on EPON versus GPON. We talked about the different technologies but um, we, we found there was actually some really differing opinions on when it makes sense to deploy DOCSIS or DOCSIS 3.1 versus EPON and GPON and, and so I mean I, I personally see a future where 
Doxus 3.1 has quite a long lifespan in it, as well as I see that EPON and GPON have their own rightful solutions in, in different places. I, I kind of wanted to open up a dialogue as to what you guys see as um, you know where Doxus is, what its lifespan is, and also if you know what you see as far as um, operators deploying EPON and GPON and and another you know which one is is one technology EPON or GPON better than the other? So Jeff, John, well, let, me, and let, let me <laughs> may, let me jump in. Uh, you know, coming from a vendor side and seeing multiple vendors or MSOs. Um, and seeing what other people are doing in the U.S. and internationally, it seems like the EPON GPON debate was more for cherry picking, meaning it, the prices have come down, fiber is not that expensive, right away are usually expensive, um, the equipment prices come down, um, and then you could offer potentially gigabit symmetrical now with GPON or EPON. I mean, we went so far that you look at Cable Labs, they made a spec uh, 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 DPOE, and then they expanded it to DPOG, right? Doxus provisioning over EPON or Doxus provisioning over GPON. So the Doxus provisioning side of things with the class of service and service classes and all that, uh, people are very used to and they like that idea. Um, the, the conducting median in between, whether it be GPON, EPON, or Doxus with modulation, all that, it, it didn't really matter um, if you were maybe doing classes of service and whatever. Um, I saw that EPON, GPON being like cherry picking, meaning uh, five customers in a node want uh, one gig service and willing to pay for it. Well, I'm not going to upgrade my entire cable plant to Doxus 3.1 today if I can just maybe cherry pick those five customers, give them fiber and fiber to the home and be done with it. Or I maybe look at RFOG. But if I'm running fiber, I might as well do GPON anyway. But if I need video, well, I still get the video out there, so maybe RFOG for video and a GPON overlay together sometimes works. Um, so there are a lot of solutions out there, but when I saw Doxus 3.1 with the potential speeds that are offered, we could offer much higher speeds, gigabit on a downstream. Uh, upstream is going to be a different story for a while, but we could utilize and exploit our existing HFC plants with not much change and still offer giggy down ubiquitously, meaning to almost everyone in my, cab my cable plant. Uh, there's still capacity planning concerns and stuff like that, but um, on the upstream, I was going to ask Jeff uh, earlier, you know, are you guys looking at 85 megahertz upstreams? Are you looking at 204? I'm sure you're looking at, you're going to say yes to everything. <laughs> so uh, I'm just wondering, like, how far along are you guys? It was interesting, Cox, when they went private, they're no longer, you know, beholden to Wall Street. Uh, they went private and got rid of the public sector side of it, whatever, you know, being publicly traded. Once they went private, a few years back, they upgraded their entire plant to one gigahertz on the downstream. Now, you don't see many MSOs doing that because they always got you know, slapped on the hand from Wall Street by saying, hey, we need a billion dollars to upgrade our cable plant. So Cox was in a very unique position to upgrade before anybody else that I've ever seen uh, be able to go to one gigahertz. I'm just wondering if that same thing might happen on the upstream for these guys or either there are other MSOs. Brady, you might know other MSOs. I have a few down Latin America looking at 85 megahertz upstream, uh, one gig down. To me, I would go to 1.218 gigahertz downstream at this point. I wouldn't do a one gig gigahertz downstream. You know, I want to upgrade my plant one time, and I would do pluggable diplex filters with potential remote fi upgrades to my node if I could. That's just my philosophy at this point. What do you think, Jeff? That's a. Those are some pretty loaded questions. <laughs> so, so I'll. I'll Take it in sort of uh, from the, from the first questions Brady asked through to you know your your very very uh, astute comments there. Um, so Epon Gpon is I it, it, I agree with you that's a red herring. That the reason uh, we're part of FSAN and as part of that we pushed very heavily to have this spec created called XGSPON. And this is where we really love kind of level the playing field because both in today's scenario, the, the differences between the EPON Mac and GPON Mac are very, very small. As a matter of fact, many of the chipsets can be booted in an EPON mode or a GPON mode. The real differences came in the optics. 
with XGS PON and 10 gig EPON, they both use the same optics now. So both get the advantage of having a very large installed base over time where everybody's using the same optics. So everybody's a winner in sort of in both scenarios. So it's not that you have to do one or the other, you could do both, you could, there's many options there. So that, that's sort of a, a non-discussion point anymore and, and people will choose what they want. It more comes down to if you want to do DOCSIS provisioning like, like you said, you would go with the DPOE spec. If like us, you do flow through provisioning, then you provision directly out of your OSS and and you can go whichever path you choose and then you just have these modules that are unique to whatever vendor you're using. So it, it makes it simpler depending on, on whichever path you choose to go with a with a, a PON technology. So when it comes to the split and, and the upstream, we're thinking of that we would do an 85 split. But it really comes down to a much more granular scenario where it's really a greenfield brownfield discussion. In a greenfield, you're you're most often required by the homeowners associations or the builders to pull fiber. So we do fiber. And and for us we do GPON. Others do EPON. Like I said, it's it's uh, it's whatever is most appropriate for the uh, operator deploying it. So that you really there's no coax that's on the table in that scenario. How do you do video for those customers? Well, initially you have to do RFOG, okay. but over time as, as you deploy a video, an IP-based video product, you'll be moving to IP video and then you'll be taking the, the RFOG out of the equation. Yep. But you have no choice in the short term, <coughs> excuse me, unless you have a, uh, a, an IP like. video product today. So, so now you have to deal with Brownfield. And, and one thing is, is, is just pretty much guaranteed. Growth continues whether it's a 50% long year over year compound annual growth rate, maybe because of people putting more and more on a mobile or, you know, going from fixed wire to, to a mobile scenario, then you, you would maybe see that rate come down a little bit. But, the difference from 50 to 47 to 45 is a matter of a couple of months. So you need to figure out how do you leverage it. The way we've traditionally leveraged it, um, thanks in large part to the effort that Cisco has done, is we've been adding more channels. But you eventually run out of channels that you can put in. We only have 32 channel modems. So now you have to look at what are your alternatives. You can add another 32-channel bonding group. You can upgrade to a uh, to a CCAP device, and then you could add some 3.1 channels. But you've got all these legacy devices. We can continue to split nodes because every time you split a node, you pull more fiber. And and a good rule of thumb is you can never have too much fiber in your outside plant. Your diet. Or, or in your diet. Well, maybe, maybe in your diet. How did I know you would go there? Uh, I tried to avoid it. Um, so, so as you get this fiber out, now you, you create a whole new series of possibilities for yourself. And in every operator system, we have got parts where we have a very highly competitive uh, scenario. You have somebody overbuilding you and somebody doing fiber. And, and one, one of our rules is the only way you really compete with fiber is with fiber. And in those scenarios, we would give very strong attention to the analysis of pulling fiber and, and being very hyper-competitive in that scenario. But that's a small part of many operators' footprint. So now you've got the rest of your footprint. Well, you're also going to have a part of your footprint where customers are very happy with, with a gigabit over DOCSIS 3.0. They have the services they need, the plants in good shape. And there's a possibility that we would continue using 3.0 for many years to come because there's still a lot of inherent capabilities in 3.0. But then you've got this middle portion 
you know, the middle of the bell curve. And here's where 3-1 gives us a very strong play. So we would start, start by deploying some amount of spectrum for 3-1. We would increase that over time. And we would be able to leverage CCAP's ability to do both 3-1 and 3-0 in those and then follow sort of our, our traditional 5 7%, 9% a year uh, upgrades of CPE and be able to move into having more and more DOTS as 3.1, which gives us higher and higher bandwidth. When we do touch the plant, as you said, if we're going to change the split and we're going to go to 85, which is probably the more economically feasible because it's going to impact very small percentages of existing CPE as opposed to 204, which is a complete CPE replacement. If we go to 85, if we're going to touch the plant, like you said, we're probably going to go to 1.2, and some may want to go to 1.8. 1.8 is a lot more problematic, and you know, you guys know way more about this than I do. But we're thinking that 1.2 would be where we would end up in everything that we're going to start. We've been deploying for a while and will continue deploying are going to be 1.2 capable passives. As we upgrade to, to 85, we in turn would start replacing all of the trunk with 85 um, diplexers. And then we would start working into the home and we would terminate the plant at the gateway device, which would be an 85. And this way we avoid the whole home amplifier scenario. So you yeah. can mix and match with legacy upstream, with, with the 85 upstream, put 3.1 in the you know, 42 or 45 to 85, start your downstreams at 108, and there's going to be a small percentage of set-top boxes you have to replace because of telemetry. But, but those are just things, those are just BAU to us. We live that world all the time. So, it, like I said, it becomes a very demand-based response to what, what others are doing that are in your footprint. So on the, on the 1.2 gigahertz, uh, Jeff, one of the topics that came up when we were at the uh, NCTC WEC panel, uh, it, was, it was discussed that 1.2 gig in the DOCSIS 3.1 specification, that was actually put in there for plants that are already upgraded to 1 gigahertz. That, you know, they had done some testing and they found out uh, one, or 1 gigahertz plants would roll off out to about 1.2 gigahertz. So, uh, you know, apparently when they were just developing the DOCSIS 3.1 .1 specification, they felt a 1 gigahertz plant wouldn't necessarily need upgraded to 1.2 gigahertz because we could we could use that roll-off section above 1 gigahertz all, all the way to 1.2 gigahertz and put DOCSIS 3.1 OFDM ca carriers out there. Is that is that something that you see is is actually true in you know, in, in, in your 1 gigahertz plants, or do you think you would have to upgrade 1 gig plants to 1.2 gig at some point in the future to actually take advantage of that roll-off band? So, so I'll, I'll answer it based on what I've seen and, and let John get into the, into the nitty-gritty because he, he understands it. I mean, I've learned a lot from him in this regard. So depending on <clears throat> when you did the upgrade, what we deployed, because we did our upgrade from 2006 approximately to 2010, the roll-off isn't quite that good because the technology has, has advanced a lot in the past 10 years. So in, in plants that were upgraded 10 years ago, you can't really get take advantage of that roll-off unless you go from a very high order modulation to a much lower order modulation. The people in an, you know, in an 870 that take advantage of the roll-off are, are using like 64 QAM in that roll-off region. I'd expect the same thing even though it's OFDM because while the carriers are smaller you still have the problems with the modulation. It's like so we're taking a step for one step forward and two steps back, or two steps forward, one step back. It's like we want to go to OFDM, DOCSIS 3, want to get higher speeds, but now we're just going to run it in some roll off and get lower speeds again. So it's kind of shooting ourselves in the foot here. Plus the 870 roll off, you're not running into the roll off of the taps. 
where uh, so maybe you could get away with a you know running it above an 860 in the roll off, uh, but for a one gig plant, your taps could be rolling off pretty hard at one gig, uh, and the fact that we have a lot more attenuation and coax right at higher frequencies, so I that one's a tough one to 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 really roll with because. If you're already going to make a change out to your amplifier modules, you might as well just change it all out once anyway, right? I mean, that's the whole point. Uh, and then having GAN technology, gallium uh, nitride, uh, I could change out modules in a housing without respacing my my housings uh, because I I'm going higher frequency, but I have more gain now in those amplifiers, so I don't have to respace and splice cables and all that. I hope that's what we're looking for, right? Yeah, but if you're telling me that I can only run 64 qualm above one gigahertz in the you know maybe to the 200 megahertz 200 megahertz more, well that's actually that, that sounds pretty good because yeah. I'm you know I, that's bandwidth I can't use and in many cases you know maybe I'm you know today we're running two, 256 qualm but I, I couldn't even think of running 256 qualm above a gig, so. I don't know. That sounds like a pretty great thing without having to do anything. I could run 264 qualm up there, right? So you I, see what I'm saying? So yeah, I see what you're saying. Like, if if uh, say Cox is already at one gigahertz on the downstream, and they don't want to touch their upstream, they're not going to change anything, right? Uh, no, no money invested, no diplex filter change. You're still five to 42 on the upstream, but to be able to expand uh, maybe another OFDM block out to 1.2 gig, and, and maybe they could, but maybe it's node plus one or node plus two. Um, I, I don't know if we're, if it doesn't work for that last customer, how do you actually offer it? You've got to be able to offer it to everybody or maybe you just push those devices to the first OFDM block and I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's really an <laughs> option. It's a d demand based scenario so that even today uh, every operator has challenges in the outside plant and in the drop and in the customer premise. And we do what we do best. We, we have some very talented technicians. They go out, they find the problems, they, they correct them, they replace cables, they replace amps, passives, etc. But it, it gets more complex as you go to these much higher order modulations. And traditionally, We've gone from the days of this 704 to digital spectrum analyzers to vector signal analyzers. And the one thing that we are still working through as part of this, and SCTE has a, has a big uh, effort going on in this space as well, is that you can sweep and that gets you so much information, but you really have to generate a mod high order modulated carrier and send it through and demodulate it to really understand what's going on in the plant. Proactive network maintenance helps a lot because you can turn cable modems into full spectrum full, full band spectrum analyzers. But in the end, it's it's really going to be the, the talented technicians who are going to be able to really find those problems. Yeah, we can get we can get a lot of information from looking at linear impairments. Nonlinear, you, you deal with as, as they crop up. But we have to really undertake the training of the technicians as soon as you possibly can and get them the tools that they need to be able to really make these technologies work as we go forward. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, I think you're spot on there. Even, even with PNM, p &M helps you find the problems, but it's it's the technicians that are that have to be out there solving it. And and I know this is going to be hard for you to believe, Jeff, but John Downey and I spoke for four hours on was that Wednesday, John? Wednesday. <laughs> to, yeah, to an SCT chapter in West Virginia on nothing but p and uh, You know, we had pre equal. John did some like pre equalization, how it works, how to turn it on in the CMTS, and he gave a live demo. But that was pretty much the the focus on it. So it, it was a uh, I don't know, John. What did you think about that training? Uh, I mean, a lot of people, myself <laughs> included, always thought P and M was pulling the modems for pre equalization information. But P and M now is much more than that, right? Full bandwidth capture on the downstream, potentially upstream spectrum analysis at the CMTS and the cable modem, 
uh, utilizing a, not, a lot more functionality like Cable Lab showed at SCT last year, not just looking at, say, the pre-collision taps, but how they react to themselves over time, the fluctuations, impulse noise, or uh, sporadic, or what were we calling it, uh, connection that was... Uh, uh, intermittent connection. Intermittent connection, yeah. So to be able to take that information and reevaluate it and try to come up with, you know, troubleshooting, um, targeted troubleshooting, right? So, I mean, it's, it's come a long way. And with DOCSIS 3.1 and 3.0, it's, you know, adding even more functionality. I always thought it was crazy to say we'd have a spectrum analyzer and a modem. <laughs> but here we are, right? Spectrum yeah. analyzer and a modem. So it's yeah. uh, pretty impressive. And Jeff, you know, you've I, been you've been on PNM for as long as it's been around, so I'm sure you have an opinion on it. Well, just so when, when I came up with the idea originally in 2005, I think, of from looking at equalization coefficients and working with uh, Hal Roberts, who at the time was with uh, Big Band, to reverse engineer them and figure out what was going on in there, we, we were looking at it from a very simplistic perspective just wanted to know what was going on and then as we really started to understand it and were able to uh, to, able to look at the, the taps in time to figure out where the, the linearities were occurring, that, that was a big, uh, big deal. But the real magic has been from, from what Cable Labs did, what you've done, what, what John has done, where you've turned it from a science experiment from when when we did it, to an art form and ways in which it can impact the daily life of, of the cable operators by taking advantage of the information that's just inherent in the network. Um, it's, it's come so much further than, than I think either Hal or I ever thought, and, it, and it's great to see. Yeah, I even thought when it was first deployed, I had the same simplistic approach was I have pre-equalization masking HFC problems. My end customer is happy, but it is masking it, and the RF guys are just sitting around not fixing anything. So a lot of MSOs are like, ah, I'm afraid to use pre-EQ because it is masking it. I want my RF guys to fix things. And I said, you know, from the beginning, it would have been nice to be able to have a way to show the MER of that modem before and after pre-equalization kicks in. And that's exactly what you're sort of talking about, right? Going to the modem, and how hard is this modem working? I need to know how hard is it working. And am I near like that needle uh, that or that straw that broke the camel's back? Am I close to that point? How do you know unless you talk to the modem to say how hard are you working? Because I really don't know how much oomph is left in that modem. Yeah, agreed. All right. So yeah, Comcast has taken that uh, <laughs> way out of the stratosphere, right? I mean, they've done, Larry Walcott and those guys have taken a lot of effort and put a lot of effort into the P&M and, and it's gone as <laughs> farther than I ever thought it would. Yeah, that, Larry, I mean, you, now that we're mentioning names, La Larry has a good team, so <laughs> uh, they, they have a, a very nice solution, but they have been working on it for many, many years and they have a lot to be proud of, so yeah. hats off to Larry. You know, back to your DOCSIS 3.1 example of running you know, above 1 gigahertz, I, I personally think what we're going to have to do, uh, you know, there were some diagrams shown from Comcast showing uh, kind of like a standard deviation curve of uh, this many modems with this downstream MER and this many modems with this downstream MER, and knowing this standard deviation curve, uh, I could probably come up with four DOCSIS 3.1 modulation profiles, a robust one, a really fast one, a mediocre one. But where was that MER taken? From one downstream frequency? Who validated that downstream MER? Is it going to be the frequencies we're actually using for my OFDM carrier? You know, I personally feel what we're going to have to do is deploy DOCSIS 3.1 with a very robust profile, record all the information back. That way we know we're using the frequency that's intended to use, monitor all the modems over time, and then we pick out from there which modems are viable for a faster speed. Uh, and then, then we start dipping up. At this point, this is going to have to be an SDN app, right? Something that's processing a lot of information, potentially, what, 4,000 subcarriers for one modem over and over and over, and then have to go to thousands of modems. So we need to get all those MER readings of all these subcarriers or even the pilots or whatever 
uh, and then decide, hey, this modem is a candidate for 4K QAM. But this modem over here, he's off a of 5 amp cascade. Uh, he's better off for 256 QAM. You know, so yeah. that's where the power of 3.1 is going to come into play, but that's further down the road. That's all we need your CMTS to do, John, is create an individual modulation profile for every <laughs> single modem. And I, I think that would make Jeff really happy. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know how happy it would be. <laughs> um, so, so one of the the beauties of three one is its ability to do just that. But it, you know, there's there's a basic rule to a lot of things we do that we sometimes lose track of, and that's is the juice worth the squeezing? So that <laughs> there are a lot of things we can do, but as John said. There are a lot of subcarriers. This is a big data application on a grand scale. And, and how much are you really going to squeeze out by doing all of these computes just to get a couple extra bits per second through one or more carriers? If there's a, if there's a big gain that's going to justify the cost and the computations, then it's, there, there's an intrinsic value to that. But to put in all these servers with all this memory and all the data storage and run all of these real-time models, you have to, there's a trade-off involved. So, uh, you know, I like the idea of what John was saying. And when we were originally sort of working through 3.1 in, in the very early days, there were originally only two profiles. There was a 3.1 profile and a 3.0 profile, and that was it. And then we started thinking about, well, we can have, we can have a per modem profile, a lot of complexity. We could have maybe 16 profiles or, or 8 or 4. I think, as John said, starting out with something very simplistic, gathering information, applying a a very simple sort of linear regression to the correlation between data we're collecting to things going on will tell us just how much juice we can really squeeze out of it. And and if it's not worth it, even just going to three one in a simplistic works everywhere profile simplifies plant management. The one thing that is a lot of time is being spent on right now is how do you measure the utilization of these OFDM blocks when you have so many different profiles? I was going to bring that up. Yeah, it's a big one. It, it's a big one, and, and it's going to take the very smart folks that are, are writing the EMSs and the NMSs to really understand the implication of it. You know, maybe, maybe we're overcomplicating it. Maybe there's some more simplistic solution. But, but that's a key element, and that's how we've always managed our, our OSP, is by looking at utilization. Those rules are going to change, and we have to think that through before we make it so complex that, that we've just made it almost unmanageable. I almost think um, when we graph this out, one, we have to decide what is my rolling time window that I'm grabbing the data, right? Is it 30 seconds? Let's say it is 30 seconds. For every 30 seconds as that window is rolling, I'm going to have to have a graph that points to the throughput in that 30 seconds and the usable throughput in that 30 seconds. So I'm going to have to have two graphs overlaying each other to say, all right, I had 100 megabits per second, but the pipe at that 30 seconds was really only worth 200 megabits, so I'm at 50%. So because the usability of that pipe is going to change, right? How many modems are transmitting, what modulation they're using, you name it. So we're going to have to have something that kind of tracks to say, all right, here's my speed at this time, but I don't know the utilization because I don't know the size of the pipe. So we have to be able to take the and look at what's been scheduled and the modulation of the modems and over a, a rolling window. And that window has to be determined. It should be, you would think, user configurable, but... Uh, like how much processing do we want to do with this as well, but you get the idea, right? Yep. All right, gentlemen, we are we have run out of time, but uh, thank you for your for your time today. We've covered a lot of great topics. 
Uh, for all of our listeners, uh, if you've liked, uh, liked the video, make sure, and you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Uh, for anyone offline, this will be posted to iTunes, to now Android has their own podcast, so this will be made available also as an audio-only video. Uh, audio only. So thanks everyone for listening and have a great day. Jeff, thank you for your time. John, thank you for your time and happy Friday. Have a great weekend all. Everyone, bye-bye. Thanks guys. Cheers.